please, resi uh, please resist um, talking with your neighbors out of respect for our speaker once again. And at the end, please stay for a while and we have, um, if you have a question. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to explore DNA codes with you tonight. Very excited to share what I think is some of the most exciting research in science right now. So before I get started, let's say something a little bit about how this uh, should work. Um, so uh, tonight, we're going to practice thinking like scientists, right? Like you do at, at these uh, science cafes. So one thing that's very important that scientists do is when they have a question, when they disagree with something, when something not, is not clear, they speak up. So at scientific meetings, um, uh, one of the most important parts are the questions. So if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand, a comment, and speak up, okay? And we can, we can address what you're, you're thinking about. Okay, so as you can see, we're going to talk about breaking DNA codes tonight. And uh, so you've probably noticed sometimes when people talk about DNA, they mention codes a lot. So uh, this excellent exhibit over at the Science Museum right now is called Unlocking Life's Code. Or maybe you've heard about the genetic code. But what does it mean to have a code in your DNA? So that's the question we're going to answer right now. But basically, the big, the big message I want you to take home tonight when you go home is that uh, we can learn a lot about ourselves, we can learn a lot about our world, um, about what makes us healthy, what makes us sick, about our ancestry, by reading what's in our DNA. Um, and I actually mean that fairly literally. We're going to learn how to look at DNA as, a, as almost like a text, a bunch of letters that you decode and you find the information inside. So, we, so as you may know, DNA is a molecule. If you've had chemistry you know a little bit about uh, how chemicals behave, and DNA has some interesting chemistry, but we're going to try to ignore that tonight a little bit, as much as we can, and we're going to try to break some codes. So, yeah. Oh, is that a question? Sorry. I don't want to put you on the spot. All right. So, uh, why do we talk about DNA having codes? It's because DNA has information in it. So, uh, you, in one way, one way you can think about your DNA is that it's like the hard drive for your cells. It carries information. So, um, so this, is, this is an example of the kind of a uh, little bit old-fashioned hard drive that's in my laptop right now. It has about 500 gigabytes of information. If you took the DNA out of one of your cells and asked how much information does it have, uh, it's about 1.4 gigabytes. I don't know. You could, you could fit a couple of, of movies on there, maybe. Um, so it seems like, yeah, it's not too bad at storing information. But in fact, cells are really, really tiny, right? So about 50 billion cells fit in the space of one hard drive. So if you did a head-to-head -head comparison, really in the same volume, DNA, the same volume of DNA could store 50 billion gigabytes compared to the 500 gigabytes in your hard drive. So DNA is really, really good at storing information. All right, so how does it do that? Well, that's what we're going to talk about here. So the first thing you should know about DNA is that really it's a chain of different kinds of chemicals, of four different kinds of chemicals. I've shown you what they look like here. We don't worry about the details of the chemicals too much. We put labels on them. We give them each a letter as an abbreviation for their name. We have A, G, T, and C. So I want you to remember those letters and forget about the uh, chemical structures. You'll learn about it when you take a, a biology or chemistry class. Okay, so DNA is a chain of chemicals. It looks a little bit like this. So the, the A, T, C, and G are on the right there in the colors. Um, and it's strung along in a chain. It looks a little bit like that. It's a really long chain. Um, but in fact, as you probably know, DNA is not just one chain of chemicals. It's two chains that are twisted around each other and they form the famous double helix. So whenever you see the double helix, right, you think DNA. And uh, so one interesting thing about these two chains that we're not going to worry too much about tonight, but you should, you should certainly know, is that they're kind of, uh, they complement each other. They're like chemical mirror images, right? So the, so the letter A always pairs with the letter T, and the letter G always pairs with the letter C. So those chemicals are called bases. We call each little pair a base pair. So I may talk about bases or I may talk about chemical letters, but it's all the same thing. So these chains get really long. They can be uh, hundreds of millions of, of uh, bases long, 
and they get so long, a one long chain forms one of your uh, chromosomes. So here's a picture of, uh, of your chromosome up there. That's just one long chain of DNA, and that sits inside of your cells. So, uh, and you have uh, 46 of these chromosomes. So here's a picture of your, of your cellular hard drive, right? Each one of those chromosomes there is one long chain of DNA. You have 23 pairs. You get 23 from your, from your mother, 23 from your father. And, uh, and so basically, chromosomes are long chains of DNA. Now, what are genes? Genes are little parts of those chains. They're little segments. Each chromosome will have uh, hundreds, thousands of different genes on them. A gene is just a segment of the chain. All right, just to give you a feel for how much information is really inside of, of these things, if you took all these chains of DNA and you strung them out and laid them on the ground, inside one of your tiny cells, it would be almost, uh, almost three yards long, or about 2.5 meters long. So that's pretty long coming out of just one of your cells. Now, you actually have trillions of cells. So if you stretched out all your DNA from all of your cells, uh, it would take you to Pluto and back and beyond. So the idea here is that your DNA can pack in a lot of information, and tonight we're going to learn how to read that information. Okay? All right, so how do we read the information in DNA? Well, I told you DNA is, a, is, this, is this molecule. It has chemical properties, so sometimes people show DNA like this. People who are interested in the chemistry of DNA will show, you can kind of see the double helix there, the colors show positive or negative charges on there. That's not very useful for reading codes right now, but that's one way. You may have seen DNA like this before. There's another way of showing the chemical structure. But most of the time, in, in my research, when I'm at work, I look at DNA like this, just a series of letters. Remember, each letter stands for one of the chemicals. And you read it actually a lot like a text. It goes from left to right and from top to bottom. So tonight, we're going to learn how we read this text. Now, if you look at it right now, you probably can't read much out of it. So that's why we need to break the code so we can read it, right? Okay, why would you want to read this? What could this actually tell you about yourself, about your world, about your health, right? Well, one reason why scientists want to read DNA is because they want to know how it works. It makes your cells go. So your genes are made of DNA. We want to know how our genes work. Our genes make other chemicals called proteins. So I'm showing DNA on the, si the left side. There's a, a three-dimensional structure of a protein on the right side. Proteins do most of the hard work inside of your cells, inside of your body. And so we want to read DNA to understand how, how genes make proteins. Uh, but there are actually a lot of other reasons that you may not have heard of before. So one reason we read DNA is to understand why people get sick sometimes. So we can take the DNA of a healthy person and compare it to the DNA of a patient who has some particular disease, and we can find where the changes in their DNA are. And then if we can crack the code, we can read what the change does. Another reason we read DNA is to find out about human history. So scientists are using DNA to trace how humans first colonized the entire world. So this map is just showing you, these the black arrows show you the roots taken by people hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of years ago as they went to colonize out of Africa into Europe, the Middle East, Asia, down into the Americas. Each of those black lines is traced with the help of DNA. So we can read that information. Another reason to read DNA is to learn about extinct species, extinct life forms. We can actually, DNA lasts, can last a long time. So we can pull DNA out of old bones of Neanderthals um, or mammoths, and we can figure out what made them tick. Um, sometimes we read about DNA to figure out about our family history. Lots of people like genealogy, and they like finding out about their, about their relationships. And so you can use DNA to figure out who you're related to. Um, here's another reason to, to, to use DNA. This is to make, make uh, stuff for us. These are big tanks of algae. They're kind of microorganisms. And they're making biofuels. These are renewable fuels. Instead of digging up oil from the ground, we can make our own fuel with the algae. But we need to be able to read their DNA in order to you know, modify them so that they can make the fuels we want. And finally, another reason why we read DNA is, uh, is in fact, everybody who has a particular disease doesn't always have the same genes. And so they can't always get the same drug. So 
we can use DNA to sort people with the same disease into different categories. People who might be harmed by one drug or who won't benefit from one drug will benefit from another. All right, well, so this is where I read DNA. Here's a picture of the lab. Um, it's a long, open hallway with lab space. You can tell there's really no ceiling. It's really cool with pipes running along, a little bit like this, pipes running along the ceiling. But I didn't think I'd always work in a place like this. So I didn't always think I'd be a scientist, and I didn't always think I'd end up reading DNA. When I was, when I was a lot younger, I was excited about science. My dad's a scientist, and I want to be an astronaut, too. But by the time I got to high school, I was really excited about music. I spent all my time practicing the piano, so I thought I was going to become uh, a music professor. That's a good way to be a musician and still earn some money. Um, but over time, uh, you know, I took some science classes again in college, and, uh, and there was one class I was particularly struggling, struggling through. If some of you have taken chemistry and had a rough time with it, you might understand. I was struggling through chemistry. I was just not, not excited about it. But at the end of my chemistry class, suddenly they showed up some of those pictures, the pictures of a DNA molecule or a protein molecule or a sugar molecule, and I realized, whoa, chemistry actually applies to life. Um, it made chemistry a lot more exciting. So I finished my degree in music, but then I went on to graduate school where I got a doctorate degree in biochemistry, a complete switch. So you can come into science from lots of different ways. So why do I like working in the lab? Well, one reason is why I like working with high-tech stuff. We have some fancy equipment here. This machine on the right is, is more, it costs more than a Porsche. So even though it doesn't look like it, but it does some really cool stuff. Uh, I like doing lab experiments. I like getting things to work in the lab. I like putting things in test tubes and walk, watching them work, seeing how organisms grow. But you know, that's not all I like to do. I like to play around with computers. Some of you probably like to do a lot of stuff with computers, so I work with computers as well. And when you're code breaking DNA, you do a lot of work with computers. So this is, this is showing the, the rows of computers we have in our lab. I also like working with uh, really great people, smart, fun people who are to talk to. The person on the right there is uh, Dr. Debbie Swain, who works in the lab with me, and she, she's showing a student how to count bacterial colonies on a plate. So it's really a fun place to be. Uh, I thought I'd mention one other thing that you can do as a scientist is you can come to things like this and t tell people about science. I also write about science um, on occasion. So I have, a lot of, I have a lot of fun. I write for this magazine about DNA sometimes. So if you want to know how your genome is like a post-apocalyptic wasteland, you can go read, read that. I also have, with some friends, we have a blog that we write about science, and every Saturday we have cat pictures that make some joke about science. So you can check it out. Okay, all right. Enough about me. Let's move on to reading DNA. So I already told you, I look at DNA like this, as a bunch of letters, right? And that there's, you know, there's information in there. How do you read that information? What's the code? Well. How to code? Well, let's think a minute about how codes work. How many of you, you've probably tried to make a, a write a code, write secret messages to your friends before? Has anybody, ev nobody, everybody has probably done that before, right? You probably thought of some clever way of writing a code. Well, here's a clever way, not so clever way, a very easy code that I came up with. Um, this stands for, I like DNA, right? It's a very easy code. It's a reverse alphabet. Whenever you have an A, I just took the alphabet backwards. I just replaced an A with a Z, or a B with a, with a Y, or a C with an X, right? That's a very simple code. One letter corresponds to another one. That's kind of easy to crack. Um, there are other codes. You can write it this way, right? You've probably heard on your computer, information is written as a bunch of ones and zeros, so you can write the same message in a bunch of ones and zeros. But this time, you need several ones and zeros to represent just one letter. But that's another way of putting your code. Well, how does the code work inside your cells? How does this work? Um, so here I'm going to show you. And there are a lot of extra details that we're going to leave out tonight. All you really need to know is two things. I'm going to show you two steps and, the, and some of the other details you learn when you take a biology class. But first, remember, I told you DNA has kind of its complement, its chemical mirror image, right? So the A's are paired with T's and so on. So that's a DNA molecule. And here's a diagram of a gene. So a gene, as I told you, is just a stretch of a chain on a DNA molecule. There's a little signal for a start, and there's a signal for a stop. So that's the gene begins and it ends, and it goes from left to right. 
So here's how the cell, in two steps, it decodes this information. First step is copy the message. Your DNA kind of stays in one place. It doesn't move very far in the cell, so you need a message that can move around. So what happens is the cell makes a copy of a molecule that's kind of like DNA. It's called RNA. I'm sure many of you have heard of it before. Um, you might notice here we've switched up the... The T's get replaced by U's in RNA, but that's not a big deal. If you see a U or a T, it's the same thing. So there's your message. That's step one. Copy the message. Now you've got to decode the message. Okay, here's our message in RNA. What happens is you just put it into the cellular decoding machinery. It has, the cell has a decoder, right? That's all you need to know for tonight. And then out comes the translation of the message, which is another string of letters that we're going to talk about, but proteins are also chains of chemicals like that. Now, you may want to know a little bit about the cellular decoding machinery, but we're not going to talk about that too much. It kind of looks like this. This is a computer simulation of all the molecules bouncing around inside a cell, except it doesn't really look like a bag of Skittles. Proteins aren't usually colored. This is just for you to uh, see what's going on. All right, so I told you, RNA, letters, you put it through the decoding machinery, you get out your proteins. Um, and so the last thing you need to know about about this DNA codes, before you can start breaking some codes, is that the output here, uh, proteins, just like DNA, they are also chains of chemicals. And these chemicals are called amino acids. Uh, they're a little different from, or quite a bit different from the bases that I showed you for the DNA. And in, whereas DNA is made of four different chemicals, proteins are made of 20 different chemicals, and they also get letters. So you can see here there's some S, T, M, Q, um, Remember, T for the proteins, though, is not the same as the T for the DNA or the C or the A. So that's a completely different alphabet. This is now we've decoded the message, and this is what it is. Okay? Now, in the end, these chains of proteins do a pretty clever trick. They, they do self-origami. They fold up into these incredibly beautiful, complex structures, although these colors are fake. They don't really have these colors. So I'm showing you a pictures of how different proteins fold up. The proteins do all the work in your cell. They're the pumps, they're the sensors, the motors, they're the structural I beams up there. Uh, they carry your cargo around, they deliver the mail, they take out the trash, they generate your power. It's the hazmat team, it gets rid of the toxic waste that comes in, and they're also defense weapons that break open uh, E. coli, bacterial cells, or other things like that. Okay, so that's a brief introduction to how we read DNA codes. Um, and so the question we're going to answer now is, what actually is the code, right? You know how to decode secret messages your friends send to you. How do we decode that message? All right, so I'm going to stop right here before we do our first activity. Ask if you have any questions, comments, what was con confusing or not. That's an, that's an excellent question. Yeah, let me, let me show you the picture here. That is an excellent question here. So you're asking, which one does it copy, right? Yeah. So, but that's a good question because here's an important point. This message up here is read from this end to that end, right? So you have to recreate that exactly. Now, if your message was on the other side, you would read it from this end to that end. So you have to copy the right side, otherwise you get a different, a different message. Does that make sense? There, like, so if you took, if you took, uh, uh, right, you write words in letters, they go from left to right, right? If you wrote them backwards, it wouldn't make any sense, right? That's writing it backwards, and it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, why are the T's replaced by U's in the, in the RNA? RNA is a different molecule. It has a little bit different chemistry. Um, it probably has to do with, uh, you know, how the system first evolved. But really, it doesn't matter too much. They serve this, they carry the same information. So T's and U's are the same. I think, any other questions? You got it all? You're all, it's all clear? You're ready to crack the code? Yeah. It's copied, uh, it goes left to right. Yeah, so this matches this, 
This match is that, right? Um, if you were, if, yeah. You want to make sure, and, the re, and this makes sure that it goes in the right direction. So reading C, T, A, you know, if I was going to go the other way, if you're going to read this message, it would be a completely different message. That one starts A, T, G, right? If you're going to read this, you would go this way, and it would be C, T, A, C. So that's a different message. Okay. Any more questions? Are we good? All right. We're ready for activity number one here. But I have to explain it a little bit so that you're, you're ready to crack the code. So what you're getting uh, is a sheet. On the first page are the instructions. On the second page and third page, that's going to be your lab notebook. You're going to fill out your lab notebook. And on the third page are some answers. Don't peek unless you're really stuck in the end. But don't peek at the answers yet. Okay? Let's ex so I'm going, to, I'm going to explain it. You may want to take off the paper clip, and then you can put things side by side. And here's the other thing I want you to do. I want you to work in teams. Find uh, two or three other people and work together. This will make this a lot easier, OK? Do you want to join in with uh, join their crew over there? You can do four. That's great. You can do five. That's all right. Do you need a pencil? Okay, while you're getting pencils, if you need a pencil, raise your hand. So listen up while we get ready, and then I'll let you read the instruction sheet. But let me give you an introduction to what we're going to do. We're going to pretend it's 1965, and you're about to win the Nobel Prize, right? You're going to crack the genetic code. You're going to go back, and you're going to crack the genetic code just the way scientists did uh, 60 years ago, the way they figured it out. You have their data, and you're going to figure it out. So let me explain this a little bit for you. So just to clarify, we did. Remember, DNA genes come in four different kinds of chemical letters or bases. Proteins come in 20 letters. Your job is to figure out how DNA, how, how DNA spells a protein, right? What's the code? How do you spell it? Remember, I showed you how my backwards alphabet spelled I like DNA. Now you want to know how genes spell proteins. So. Uh, Let's think about this for a minute, uh, how we do this. So another way, I showed you another example of code. You can write things in ones and zeros in computer code. So if you wanted to write the alphabet using ones or zeros, how many ones and zeros would you need for each letter? Let's think about this for a, a minute. Right? You can't just use one, one, or zero for a letter, because there are only two, two options. Right? You need five, right? just like this. So. Five ones and zeros give you A, and then by the time you get to the end of actually I didn't count right, I'm sorry, this is not quite it, but you know, then the next one will have a one, zero, 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 and you go on, and then you have enough for 26 different combinations. Um, but actually you have more than 26, so I, I ended wrong there, sorry. Anyway, the same idea applies to DNA, right? So in DNA, and you can think through this, there are three DNA bases or letters that spell one amino acid, okay? So this is an important clue for cracking what you're going to, to solving the genetic code here. So remember, I told you the amino acids are chemicals, and they have a letter name there. We're just going to work with the letter names. And uh, each of those three letter groupings is called a codon. So you need to know which codon goes with which amino acid. That's cracking the genetic code here. So. Uh, the genetic code was really cracked uh, uh, 60 years ago by these, these two guys in their labs. Who, they won the Nobel Prize, Marshall Nirenberg and Gobin Karana. They collected the data that you have on your lab notebooks right now. And they looked at that data, and they were able to figure out at least part of the genetic code. So here, can you think like a Nobel Prize winner? That's what we're going to do. And yes, you can. That's the answer. So here's what they did. Let me give you an example. We'll walk through an example, and I'll let you go on, on some code breaking here. All right, here's what they did. So they decided, well, an easy way to break the code is to just try a bunch of the same letter and see what comes out. Remember, three letters spell one amino acid. They already, they kind of knew that already, or they had an idea that that was true. So they made an artificial series of A's, an artificial RNA molecule. They put it in the cellular decoding machinery, which we're going to call cell-free extract. And out of that came your protein letters. So 
looking at this, you can already figure out what the first codon is, right? Three A's in a row spell a K. Does that make sense? All right, let's do another, let's do another example here. They made a different one. It was AG, 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 after all. They put that in the cellular decoding machinery, and they got two different kinds out, right? R, E, R, E, R, E, R, E. So now, hmm, which, how do you spell R, and how do you spell E, right? So there are two possibilities. Remember, I told you three letters spell a protein word. So if you look at AG, 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 there are two options. One codon could be AGA, and another one could be GAG. And so one of them, you don't know which one yet, is R, and the other one stands for E. You don't know which one. Your job is to figure out which one is which. Um, and just to, uh, yeah, so that's your task, all right? So read the instructions. If you get stuck, raise your hand. We'll come around, we'll help you, we'll give you a hint. Um, if you think you're done, or if you've cracked a few and you think you can't make any more progress, you can check your answers on the last page. All right, yeah, oh, question here. Okay. That's the answer, yeah, yep. All right. If you need some help, raise your hand. If you don't understand the instructions, we'll come around. We'll get you started, okay? How's it going? Okay. You're going to fill out this table here, right? You're going to fill out that table using this information. Got it? Got it. All right. Oh, I almost show you the answers. <laughs> there. All right. How are you doing? You want to be part of, you should work together as a group. You want to work together? Yeah, you do. Come on. I mean, if you really want to do it yourself, it's fine. It's a lot more fun. Let me give you this. If they want a hint, they like say I'm stuck on this one. You know, give me a hint. So they help along. Thanks. How's everybody? Everybody getting started? If you're stuck, raise your hand. So, I have an answer key. If they want a hint, we can, you know, they'll say, oh, I don't get this one. Give them a hint. Better, right? Sure, thanks. How's it going? Make sure you don't cheat. Right, the answers are there. Yeah, those are the answers. That's okay. If you didn't see them yet. So, you just you understand what you're going to do? You're going to fill out these blank spaces. Yeah, so what about, what about, uh, this one should be easy, the F, right? T, 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 so three, t there's only one option, three T's, right? Spell an F. What about, and, and, there is another F, so there are two ways to spell F. That's the, and you'll see F shows up down here. See this? So the other option is F could be T, C, T. CTT or TTC, and you don't know which one it is yet. You're going to have to figure out some of the others. And if you need a hint, let me know. How's it going? Does this make sense at all? You want to start with the easy one? Look at this first one here. Uh, remember, three letters right here spell one letter right here. So three letters in a row of this is what? Oh, I'm pointing to the top one. Right. T, yeah, right? T, T, T is F. So you can go ahead and write in this space T, T, T. Nope, for F, right there. Right there, see, here's the F. Yeah. Yep, T, T, T. Now how about this one? This is the one for P. So th this spells that, all right? So, no, it was, yeah, so three of these, so three of these will spell one of this. So CCC spells P, which is down there. You got it? It lost you? All right, let's, it's kind of like the logic puzzle process of elimination. You have to eliminate some as you go. If you need a hint, I'll give you a hint. So, you need a hint? Which one are you stuck on? 
Why don't you start with the easy ones right here? Let's start with this. How many different three letter combinations could you have here, right? It's only one. The only thing you can get is TTT, right? So TTT has to spell F. Does that make sense? So find the F here and then write TTT in the blank space. You see that? You got TTT. Now look at the next one. CCC, that's the only possibility. So it's going to be P. So for P, you can write in CCC. And same thing for A. Now it gets a little tricky once you get down to row number four. And I'll give you some. A, A, A. That's it. You got it. Now, uh, so see how far you get, okay? If you think you got as far as you can get, you can turn to the next page, the last page, and sort of compare your answers or ta just take a look at what you got there. This is hard. It's I think a, some people are getting confused that um, it might not be in the same order. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the tricky part. Yeah, it's hard to, to completely convey that. Great. Well, we'll... we'll uh, We'll see the answers now here. All right. Okay. Let's let's stop it there. It's, it's kind of hard, huh? This is how, well, you figured out you win a Nobel Prize, right? So, but this is a little practicing of the kind of code breaking that, that we did, that scientists did to start reading our DNA. So everybody turn to the next page with the answers. Let me show you. The next page will have something that looks like this. All right. <laughs> well, if you want to, you can take them home. If you really want to figure out the rest, you can take it home and solve. It's a brain teaser, right? It's like those puzzles where you have the process of elimination where, you know, Janie and Charlie and Samantha and Fred go to a party and each one gets a balloon of a different color and all that, right? You've done those kinds of logic puzzles. It's a little like that process of elimination. So it's a little, little tricky, but you get a little flavor for what people did to crack the code. All right, anybody have any questions or thoughts? What do you, what do you, what do you think? How, how was it? Was it hard? Yes? <laughs> Confusing. Confusing, uh-huh. So often science will look at the, scientists will look at their data, I will tell you this from personal experience, and be really confused about what came out. It's not always clear. All right. Okay, well, let's turn to the other page, and we'll see the answers. They finally figured this out using data like that. But let's just go over this, this idea of that three different letters, three different letters spell one amino acid letter, right? So you can look up here. Your L, it can be spelled by CTC, CTT, CTC, four different con combinations or codons, right? Okay. So take a look at that for a minute. Let's see if you can figure out how to read. We'll talk about how to read this table, how to figure out what you want. So on the left side, you're going to look and you're going to see, ask, what's the first letter of that three letter codon, right? So let's say you begin with a C, then you look in this row. If your second letter is a T, you go look at the top, the top row, and then the other side tells you them, so you can figure out where, where they, they are. So take a look at that table for a minute. Do you see any patterns? Take a look at the patterns of letters that code for different amino acids. Does anybody see any patterns that strike you, that look interesting? What do you see? So for example, let me give you a hint. So some 
some amino acids, some letters, more or more codons that spell them, but the ones, different, different three-letter combinations that spell the same amino acid have some things in common. Do you notice anything? Yeah. The first two letters are usually almost always the same, right? And the third one can change, right? And so that's one pattern in there. All right, we'll, we'll stare at it a bit. There are, def there, there, are, uh, there are various patterns you can pull out where you can stare at. We're going to get some practice now in the next activities using this table to decode, to decode things. Um, all right. So one thing, here's, here's, before we move on to the next activity, actually, why don't you get, take a little practice here. Let's practice reading this table. There's a secret message, or at least part of it. You can, secret message uh, at the bottom of your answer sheet. Can you decode it with this table? And remember, I, I switched. The U's in the secret message should stand for T's here. So U and T stand for the same thing. So why don't you take a minute, practice reading the table, see if you can decode the secret message. If you know the message, uh, raise your hand once you can read it. All right, so does it make sense how to decode this? You're going to look for U or TCC. TCC stand is S. So write an S above the UCC. Yeah. Work together, OK? Work as uh, teams. You'll get it done quickly. Can you think, can you figure this out, how to read the secret message? I made a mistake here. The U's are the same thing as T's. So let's look for the TCC, stands for S. So you write an S there. Now where's a GAG? -G? You think you can find it? Look at the first letter is G, second letter is A. So there's a GAG, -G, and that's E. So you can write an E above that. Yeah. Let's see how far you can get on this. We're gonna we're just gonna get a little practice reading this. Does this make sense? Or do you need a little uh, help with this? So remember the the U's and the T's are the same thing. So this says T these are only in T's, so T C C. Let's figure out where T C C is. There it is as an S. So write an S above that. All right. All right. Yeah, you got it. Is it messages? It's messages. Sorry. But... All right. So we're going to move on. This was a little practice. We're going to move on to the next activity, even if you didn't finish. You're going to get some more practice doing this. All right? Oh, let's hand out. Hey, Kasha. Here we go. Let's hand out these. When you're done with those, we're going to hand out these. All right. How many of you have tried the bitter taste test, for gen the bitter genetic taste test? You've tasted something and it was really bitter, and uh, now we're going to do a little of that right now. Yeah. If you don't really want to taste it, you don't have to. All right. So we're going to try this out, and then we're going to decode your your DNA to read to read this. Here, you want to pass them down, or right, let's see. I'll try to hand them out here. Whoops! Everybody, get a paper strip. Unless you don't want to try the paper strip. There you go. If you don't want it, you don't have to. There you go. All right, can you take one and pass it on? Here, take one and pass it down. There we go. You uh, pass these strips down here. Just lay it on your tongue. Who, does, 
Who, raise your hand if it tastes bitter, if it tastes awful, okay? If you don't taste anything, raise your hand. Tastes like paper. To me, it tastes like paper. Right? All right. Whoops. What? Never mind. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. Now that, you've, now that you've tasted it, the difference between those who can... The difference between those who can taste the bitter taste and those who can't almost always comes down to just a few spelling changes in your genes. And we're going to find those spelling changes now, right? So look at the sheet you've got. Where's our uh, sheet here? All right, everybody, let's listen up for a minute here. All right, let's listen up here. We're going to get the instructions. Shh. All right. Now you're going to take a look. So the chemical on this sheet is what's on the paper. And some people can taste it and some people can't. And uh, there are three small, so read what's on the sheet. There are three small spelling changes in one gene that sits in your, that makes a protein that sits in your taste buds uh, that determines whether you can, you can spell it, uh, whether you can taste it or not. So at the bottom of the page, you have a DNA sequence from somebody who can taste it and a DNA sequence from somebody who can't taste it. So I want you to find where they are different. Use your team members, the people around you, and compare those two, two uh, sequences and see if you can find the codons that are different, the group of three letters. You found it? All right. Now use the genetic code table from the last exercise, your last sheet, and see if you can figure out what, what the amino acid changes are. What, are the, what do those changes actually do? I'll give you a couple minutes. Oh, yeah, I just throw them down. Just figure out the ones that are different. Look for the ones that are different. And f there are three. I'll give you a hint. There are three differences. Now you need to translate them. Where's your uh, oh, genetic code table and figure out what, what's different. Just put it on the table. I don't know. We'll come around and throw it, throw it out. There are three. There are three differences. Can you find them? I don't think so. Oh, well, <laughs> they'll, they'll clean them off. It'll be okay. Yeah. Here, you can uh, find a box somewhere. Maybe there's a trash can up around there. You can see if you want. All right. Did you find the three differences? Do you know what the... Did you use the genetic code to find the letter differences? Who's, who found the answer? You found one. Good. Which one? Yeah, P and A. So you got P and A, there's one more. Here we go. Got it. All right. Yeah. All right, everybody listen up now. Let's listen up for a second. So who found the three differences? All right. So what do you think? Is, is it, what do you think about just those small, do you believe it? Those small spelling changes make the difference between whether you can taste it or not. You believe it? Is that just these little changes in your DNA? Well, let me ask you a question. If you met somebody, you didn't know they were a taster or not, and I gave you their DNA sequence, could you now tell me whether they're probably a taster or probably not? Yeah, yeah right? You, you'd be able to read their DNA and predict what, what, uh, whether they're a taster or not. And so that's actually a lead-in to, to the next activity sheet that you have. This is, what, uh, this is what physicians are doing right now 
to predict which patients should get which drugs, right? So um, this is an example of a little of a of a protein that we're going to talk about just very briefly. A few spelling changes. So that beautiful structure it pumps uh, it pumps atoms in and out of cells. Uh, just a couple small spelling changes just completely wreck that fold, right? But other spelling changes make it do something else, all right? And actually, mutations in this cause, it, cause a disease called cystic fibrosis. It destroys the protein. It's mostly in your lungs, um, um, but, but other places as well. And it causes all sorts of uh, effects. And most patients uh, don't live very long. But actually, we're doing a lot better now that we can get them the right drugs. So back in 1970, if you had this disease, you lived to be on average five years old. These days, it's gone up quite a bit to 35 years old, and we hope with more and more uh, improvements, we can make that even better. So um, what the mutations do is they destroy this, this protein. So when you get a cystic fibrosis patient, you need to know which drug to give them, because some of them, here's, here's, the, uh, here's the problem. Lots of patients can, have this, patients can have the same disease, cystic fibrosis or anything else, but different mutations causing that disease, right? Some misspelling in that protein will cause the disease, and they will need one drug, and a different misspelling will mean they need a different drug. So what happens is patients, we, uh, physicians take patients' DNA, and they send them to a genetic testing clinic. And a genetic analyst has to look at that DNA sequence and decide which drug the patient should get. So that's who you are going to be right now. So what you're, you have a sheet now. Um, you're going to be part of the ACGT Genetic Testing Services. You're an analyst there. And before you, you have a DNA sequence from a patient, and you have a DNA sequence from a healthy person. You have to do two things now. You have to find the mutations, find where they're different, where the patient is different, and then figure out which drug they get. Um, at the top part, it tells you which drug they should, if they have this mutation, they should get this drug. If they have a different mutation, they should get this drug. So this is uh, something we're calling personalized medicine these days. We can, we can not just give everybody with the same disease the same drug, but we can give them a drug that matches their, their mutation. All right? So go ahead and work in teams and see if you can and use the genetic code to, tr to find the mutation and figure out what the drug is. What do you got? You already got it. Thumbs up. And you signed it and date? All right. So here's the hint. You don't need to translate the whole sequence with the genetic code. Just find where they're different. What do you think? So let's see if these are different here. So just put your finger, go along one by one. Maybe hint, try it. You could even go, just scan it. We'll use computers to scan it in the, in the clinic, but you don't have a computer today, right? You got it? How are, you, how are you doing here? You found the difference? All right, so which one is it? What's that change? GGA to TGA. Here's your genetic code. Uh, yeah, there are some different answers, by the way. All right? How's it going? You got it. Easy. Okay. All right, let's take one more minute and see if you can get the, uh, the answer here. Hey, Kasha? You can start now. Who, who had the drug uh, Adalurin? Me. Me. All right. Who had, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce these, Calideco? Me. All right. Yeah, Calideco. And uh, Lumicaftor? Same. Did nobody have, did, maybe we didn't get those uh, sheets around. All right. So now you know how to, how, to know, how to read somebody's DNA and know something about them. What are some of the other things you think uh, somebody could find out about you from your DNA? Reading this. What your hair color is? Any other? What do you think? Your ancestry. Whether you were at a crime scene or not? Maybe. 
Who do you think should be able to read your DNA? Would you want to give your DNA to anybody to read? Do you think they could, uh, yeah? Uh, a computer. So, like, what does <laughs> what? the computer do to change it? Does it just analyze what, what the... Uh... Oh, that's a good question. Let's come back to that at the end. Yeah, we'll answer that. All right, well, this is a big crowd, so we'll move on to the next uh, exercise. All right. Last code-breaking activity. Who's ready to find out how different you are from a Neanderthal? Uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to figure out something else. So, you want to hand these... Uh... Alright. Alright, everybody, let me have your attention for a few minutes while we hand out the next sheet. I'm going to tell you about Neanderthals and how their DNA might be different from yours or maybe not. Huh? Alright, okay. They're handing it up. Okay, so there are, two, there are a couple things you're going to have to know to do this next activity. First of all, you've got a little practice working with a genetic code to read our DNA, but in fact, most of our DNA can't really be read with a genetic code like that. Genes, those genes that you read make up only a tiny fraction of all of our DNA, less than 2%. So here's an example of a chromosome, a little section, and the parts of the genes are these straight lines up and down. And most of this is just space where you don't see parts you can read with the genetic code, the genes. There's a lot of other stuff there. So that's the kind of code breaking I do right now. We're trying to figure out how to read the rest of it. So um, the parts, uh, so, so the parts that we're actually trying to read um, are regions that control our genes. So I told you that genes, they have a start and they have a stop. Um, but genes also, before the start, they have a little region that's a control region that decides when the gene gets switched on and when it's switched off. So does anybody have an idea why you'd want to switch a gene on or off? Yeah. If you have a disease, it may be switched on in one case and off in another. That's actually, uh, that's, that's different. That's a spelling change in the DNA. But think about it, this, yep. Yeah. yeah, you want to control the production of proteins. So think about it. So most of your cells have exactly the same DNA, but they're all really different. So a muscle cell needs different proteins from a brain cell, from a liver cell, or this and that. So these control reasons are important. Only some of your genes come on in each types of your cell. You don't want, your liver cell doesn't need to be like an eyeball to detect light, right? So you don't need the proteins that detect light. You need the enzymes that'll help, uh, help break down uh, things that you eat and drink. So you have these control regions. So I'm going to tell you very briefly how they work. What happens is, uh, to switch genes on, there's a little protein that comes and sits on it like that. Uh, it's called a transcription factor. You don't really need to remember that. But it sits down on a little part of the DNA there. And it brings the cellular uh, message copying machinery. And so it, it makes a message. And that's how it works, right? And so here's a picture of what it really happens. There's a piece of protein sitting on DNA. So what I try to do, and what a lot of people who are now trying to decode what's going on in our, our genomes, try to figure out how a protein matches to DNA. And the way they match, um, this is the way we represent this other kind of code. So you saw the genetic code table. Now you're going to work a little bit with a completely different kind of code. So this is an example of a DNA sequence where a protein called uh, PU3F2 sits down and it binds. But it doesn't recognize, it doesn't stick to the same sequence every time. It can be a little different. So looking at this, or looking at this, uh, do you have any ideas how you might read this? What does it mean here that this says A, C, and T? Any ideas? Well, yeah, those are the names of the letter. So we're, we want to know about the, about the DNA that is recognized by this. It means you have three different options, right? 
you could have an A, you could have a C, you could have a T, and that guy will still stick to that part. So it can, it's okay, it'll have some spelling differences. And the reason why some are taller than the other is it means you usually have an A here. Sometimes you have a C, and occasionally have a T. With this one, you almost always have a T. Sometimes a C, right? Does that make sense, how you, how, you, how you look at this? You have to stare at it quite a while. This one, you always have an A, and you always have a T here. So I'm going to show you, we're going to look at an example in Neanderthals, right? Let's see. So it's, that example is going to be on your next sheet here. You're going to look for these two codes, these two binding sites in the DNA there, and figure out uh, there's an important change between humans and Neanderthals somewhere in one of these sequences, and you're going to find it. So here's, a, here's somebody's idea of what, what Neanderthals are doing, hanging out in their, cave, in their uh, cave for a while. So what I've given you on the sheet there is a control region for an important gene, uh, as, you, as you can read. So mutations in this gene uh, cause speech problems in humans. And scientists think that this gene played an important role in the way speech evolved in humans. So scientists have been trying to look for differences in this gene and its control region between Neanderthals and humans or humans and chimps. So what I want you to do is to find two things. So you're going to look at this DNA sequence, and I want you to, to figure out where is the place where humans are different from everybody else on that sheet, right? So that's one. And then the second thing I want you to find is where humans and Neanderthals are the same but different from everybody else, from chimps, from elephants, from chickens. Uh, and then the last step is to take a guess at which of these, uh, we'll go back up here now, which of these two sites uh, was changed by the mutation in humans. Any questions? Looks like a bunch, you're already started, huh? Good. So, what do you think? What's a zebra fish? A zebra, it's a fish. It's a kind of fish. Right? Yeah. All right, you're already finding them here. You got them? What do you think? All right. So, you found the one difference where humans are different from everybody else, right? Good. So, take a look at that and see... Do you recognize any one of these around there? It's a little hard. You get to stare at it. All right. So one way to do this is to start at the. You want to see. So this is a human DNA, right? This is Neanderthal DNA. This is a chimpanzee DNA. And you want to go from top to bottom. Everybody's the same here, right? Except for these guys. They lost it. Here, the top two are C's, and everybody else is a G. So here we're we're a little different. Humans. Do you know what a Neanderthal is? It's an ancient kind of human that lives uh, 30, 50,000 years ago, but they don't live anymore. They're closely related. So you're trying to find where they're different. So there's one place. Where did, we, where did I see it? Whoops. I lost it. Uh, can you figure out which of those two uh, motifs there had is right over that change between humans and Neanderthals. See if you can figure out. Do you see a T-A-A-T, -A -A or do you see something like a, a T-A-C-A-T, -A or a T-G-A-T? See if you can compare it to those, to those codes. There you go. So you already picked this one out. So look at this one here. You found this change. T-A-A-A-T-T. -A -A -T -T. Which one does it look like, this one or this one? Yeah. Okay, so we want to figure out where humans and Neanderthals are different from everybody else. So what you do is you start on the first row and go down. They're all the same, except the bottom. These guys are really different. Zebra fish, are, you're really different from a fish. You go down, they're all the same. Yeah, you know, so. Now let's look at here. Uh, right here, you found that one. Everybody else has a T, has an A, except for that. And that guy has a T. And so let's see if this, so the next thing I want you to do is find this difference and see, does the whole area around there, does it look more like that or that? All right. 
All right. Since we're running, since we want to make sure we, we take a look at this here. Yeah, did you sort of find some of these differences? Yeah, it's a little, it's a lot of staring. You tend to go, uh, your eyes get a little blurry after a while if you stare at it too much. You're going down, going from top to bottom is a good way to do it. All right, so this one right here is where humans are different from all the other uh, organisms on this list. It's one change that's unique to humans. So maybe that change was, you know, this is still, I'm just speculating here. Maybe that change was important in changing how this important speech gene was controlled, right? So if you compare it to the top, it actually looks a little similar. We have A, T, and instead of a G, you have A. So A, T, A, C, A, T. A, T, well, look here. A, T, A, C, A, T, A, 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 T, T, C, A. That's what's up there. It's a little hard to see. You've got to squint sometimes. But we changed it to a T. So let me ask you this. Last two more questions. And then you get to ask more questions of, of uh, me here. So look at this right here. This tells you, this is a good, oh, you can't see it. That protein will sit there, will recognize this if you have a G or an A, right? Everybody else has an A there. We have a T. What do you think happened? It's going to miss, right? We have a mutation that destroyed the code, right? It changed the code. That protein probably, actually, in the if you... It no longer sits down on that region, and it doesn't control our gene in the same way. So this important gene that's important in human speech is actually regulated differently than it is in other species and was probably different from what it was in Neanderthals. Okay, one last question. Uh, which two are the most similar on this chart? There's one difference, right? And then chimps and gorillas, yeah. So can you kind of see a, a, a relationship here? Humans and Neanderthals are really, really close. There are very few changes between us when we look at Neanderthals. A little more on chimps, but not nearly as much as zebrafish. Look at the fish. The little stars mean it's deleted. It's gone. Right? So this is the kind of code breaking that, uh, that I try to do in the lab right now. We try to find uh, changes like this that changed how genes are regulated. Changes like that often lead to disease. They help make us who we are. Um, and they were important in our history, making us who we've become. All right, so do you have, let, where is my, where's my sheet? So does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Oh, okay, you had a, you had a great question. All right, so. For the whole evening, I've been telling you to forget about the chemistry, to just think about the letters. But how do we get the letters? That's your question, right? DNA is this, it's, you pull it out of your cells. You may have done that experiment. It's, a, it's glop. Well, we have a machine that takes the chemistry. It takes each letter, and basically, uh, you put the DNA, your DNA sample, in the machine, and it copies each letter, one at a time using artificial chemicals that light up. They light up, so they show light, and you can use, a, you can use, and the machine has kind of a microscope in it, it takes pictures. So the old way they used to do it, maybe if it was green, you knew it was an A. If it was yellow, you knew it was a, a, a G, maybe. And now they use it, uh, it's, it's a little bit different from that. But it turns the chemistry into light signals, which then we, it lets us know the order of the bases. Uh, so, any, any other questions? What do you, let's see if I can find my... I've got a question for you. Um, how similar do you think we are to, uh, to chimpanzees? How often do you think these differences occur? One out of every hundred letters, how, how many are different, do you think? Point two. Well, not quite point two. Depends on how you count them. Somewhere between. Huh? So it's it's it depends on how you count it. It's a little different, but anywhere from ninety-seven to ninety-eight percent, ninety-six to ninety-eight percent, 
We're almost, so our DNA is almost completely the same. How about the differences between, between two other people? How many do you think there, there are? Yeah. One in a thousand. But you have three billion of these, so actually that adds up. So the difference between you and some other person is actually maybe three million of these different 